We've just been talking about, can you run databases on Kubernetes? What are the pitfalls? What are the recommendations? Let's project forward. I'm going to push this forward here, OK? Let's talk about the Kubernetes native database. And you're thinking, is there just one? Or what is he talking about? Well, what does it mean for a database to be Kubernetes native? I'm going to try to give you a definition, and I'm going to try to persuade you that this is a thing and why it matters. So let's go. Next slide. OK. So we're here because we're into cloud native. This is the world that we are living in, right? So we think cloud native, we think about things like containers, we think about microservices, we think about automation, we think about good observability and monitoring, all of these things, right? So what would that mean for a database to be cloud native? OK, let's hold that thought. I'm going to pop one more on you here. Uh, hit, it, hit the next slide. OK, what would a Kubernetes native database be? Is that the same thing as a cloud native database? Or is it um, cloud native plus some so special sauce? Or is it an entirely disjoint set? What, what does that mean? Um, OK, let's go for a third one, because I'm just dropping terms on you without defining them. I love this. It's great. I'm in my happy place. Serverless database. OK. I'm expecting some uh, furrowed brows and maybe some quizzical looks here. Is that a thing? Could a database be serverless? Yes or no? Raise your hand if you think a database could be serverless. OK, OK. Uh, maybe maybe a, a little more uh, optimistic viewpoint than I was expecting. That's great. OK, so I got about a 20% hit right there. Let's keep going. OK, so yes, um, we are writing a book. Uh, I, I want to talk about this not in the normal sense of, um, hey, I'm here. I'm going to plug my thing. Um, but I want to share this as this is a love letter from Patrick and I to the community. Um, we got involved with this almost two years ago with the DOK. Um, and after about maybe four or five months of being involved and immersed in all of these great podcasts and things that Bart was running through guest after guest, I was like, there's a book here. I know there's a book here. And um, if I don't write it, someone else is going to write this book. And I would hate for that to not be the thing, because I have a passion about this and want to do it. Um, but also, I was like, I don't know about writing this whole entire book by myself, which is why I reached out to Patrick. And uh, boy, I almost fell off the stage there. Um, so anyway, I, I want to share that because I want this to be a resource for the community, and I don't want this to be the only data on Kubernetes book. There needs to be like 15 data on Kubernetes books or more, right? So um, this is my challenge to you, that this is just the beginning. Um, and by the way, this talk is based on chapter 7. So I'm going to leave a bunch of stuff out. Um, so when the book comes out in December, you'll be able to read it. Or you can go to the Portwork site and get the uh, early release copy now. Or it's on uh, O'Reilly Learning if you have that. OK, let's keep going. OK, so one of the things that we do in the book is we take the CNCF definition of cloud native, and we try to project that into the world of data infrastructure. What does that mean? Uh, and so what we came up with was a derivation of these five points. That let's say a, a cloud native database or a cloud, any cloud native data infrastructure needs to embody these things. I would love for you to tell me what I'm missing, but afterwards. OK, so number one, um, leveraging compute, network, and storage as commodity APIs. So no special sauce here. You need to be doing it through industry standard APIs. Uh, second is separate the control and data planes. So the code that is managing your database is separate from the database, which is managing your data. Number three, make observability easy. So logging, metrics, tracing, right? These should all be features that are built into this data infrastructure for it to be considered cloud native. Four, make the default configuration secure. No default passwords, people, right? We've moved on. We've, we're past this point now, right? Uh, but also, in the Kubernetes world, in the container-based world, you don't have to leave all the ports open by default, right? So this is like a principle of least privilege applied in the data infrastructure world. Number five, prefer declarative configuration whenever possible. So those of us who are familiar with how Kubernetes works, this is music to our ears, right? This is the language we speak. All right, so with those principles in mind, I want to push forward into uh, the next slide where we're going to actually look at a couple of databases here. I'm doing this super fast, and I'm not doing these databases justice.
but I want to give you a couple of things and pull out some points to see if we can define what it means to be Kubernetes native. So bear with me. Okay, so the first one we'll look at is TIDB. Uh, this comes out of PingCap, and uh, this is a MySQL-based database, uh, but it also layers in a columnar database alongside it. So they've achieved something like that they call hybrid transactional and analytic processing, or HTAP. Um, so what they're doing with this is there's a separation of concerns. There's a separation of compute and storage. So the layer that's at the top of this diagram is the TIDB, uh, TIDB instances. These uh, don't do any data storage. They just do query processing. So they're compute-centric. The storage cluster is a mixture of TIKV, which is MySQL, and TI Flash, which is a columnar database. So these, notice, can be scaled independently from each other and from the uh, query layer. And then also you can run Spark alongside it. Um, and behind or connecting everything together is a metadata layer known as this PD layer. Um, so what they've done is they've broken up a database into microservices, each piece of which can be scaled independently. Um, one thing that's really interesting is this database only runs in Kubernetes. You cannot run this thing outside of Kubernetes. OK, so go to the next slide. Um, now, when I say that it's Kubernetes only, does that mean that it's Kubernetes native? Maybe, maybe not. So they have an operator. Uh, TIDB has an operator. And it controls all of the components. And uh, you describe everything that you want through custom resources, CRDs, that they define, which is great. So they have a TIDB cluster, pretty obvious. That's the basic capability. And then you can extend it and attach to it a TIDB monitor that hooks up uh, Prometheus to it and so on. They've also made maximum use, you heard this referenced in the panel, making maximum use of Kubernetes APIs, where the scheduler didn't do everything that they needed in terms of pod scheduling. They've extended the scheduler using the Kubernetes extensible API for this. So another great utilization of the existing technology, embrace and extend. So let's keep moving. OK, so when you create a TIDB cluster, um, it allows you to specify the number of instances that you want of each of the components, whether it's TIDB, TIKV, uh, TI Flash, et cetera. Um, and then you can optionally, as I mentioned, attach a Prometheus Grafana stack to it. Now, I was talking with Ed Huang, his co-founder of PingCap and, and one of the inventors of this database, um, and, and, he, and he said, well, this is a Kubernetes native database, but it's not totally cloud native. And I was like, Wait, what did you say? That didn't, that didn't quite register with me. And what he meant was that um, a couple of things. One was that they had their own custom metadata server that they built. And he was like, we'd like to replace that with etcd, which is a more Kubernetes native kind of tool. Fair enough. Another point was um, that they were interested in using object storage instead of doing everything based on persistence volumes. Now, you heard this discussed uh, quite a bit in that, in that panel, so I'll, I'll not belabor the reasons why for that, but just a couple of interesting data points. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So we'll switch gears and talk about AstroDB. OK, so full disclosure, AstroDB is a database product. You can uh, download the white paper that describes the design of this. We're working on open sourcing the other bits. Uh, We'll eventually uh, get there, I'm sure. So, but I, what I wanted to talk to you about is the, the open source design that we've talked here about refactoring Apache Cassandra into microservices. So if you, uh, if you subscribe to this managed service, this is what's going on behind the scenes. So uh, there's a few things here. Uh, one is that it, is, it, it ha uses a mixture of persistent volumes and object storage. Um, it also, uh, as TIDB does, it also integrates a, a Prometheus and Grafana. And uh, it has a layer that allows API access of different flavors, a project near and dear to my heart because I'm working on it called Stargate. And uh, interestingly, uh, and, and a novel thing that maybe we didn't talk about that much today is the idea of multi-tenancy and the idea of multi-cluster, which we did talk about. So these are two important features of this database, that it, it um, shares across multiple tenants, and it can be run across multiple clusters. 
and I mean Kubernetes clusters. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So uh, Astra also defines CRDs and uh, also has an operator that manages the database, um, uses Kubernetes ingress on the inbound side to route traffic from different tenants to the, the right instances of services that are responsible for serving queries. So we do have uh, allocation of different microservices to specific tenants, but many of them are shared across multiple tenants. Uh, there's an IAM service to which all the authentication and access control are delegated. And um, the storage, the way that the, the strategy for storage is, is that data is initially cached in local persistent volumes. And then when it's to be written out to disk, um, the SS tables, which is how Cassandra stores data, those are written out to object storage. And one of the things that's really cool about how this uh, it, this decoupled architecture is that there are processes like compaction in Cassandra that uh, combine down multiple SS tables to remove and deduplicate data. Uh, that can run as a background process that just goes and operates on those files in object storage. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to zoom way back out and let's see if we can derive any principles here about what it means for a database to be Kubernetes native. Okay, so, and a lot of these are gonna look pretty similar to the principles that I showed at the beginning about cloud native data infrastructure. And that's by design, right? So we have maximum leverage of Kubernetes APIs. So use stateful, stateful sets and persistent volumes where they make sense. Uh, use etcd, you can run your own copy of etcd if you need to, it doesn't have to be the core, uh, the, the core control plane one. Um, Use ingresses, extend the scheduler if you need to. The second one is use automated and declarative management. So use CRDs and operators where that makes sense. Uh, you shouldn't be running your data or managing your database or configuring it through user interface anymore. This should be happening through an operator and you should be, the way that you should be saying what you want is through making a change to a CRD. We can get there, right? Um, this is aspirational. Uh, third is observable through standard APIs. So, for example, putting a, a Prometheus endpoint on all your pods so that metrics can be scraped from it. Secure by default. I mentioned the, what the table stakes are here before, right? Um, but in, in terms of port settings and default passwords, but also um, having the ability to integrate with identity management solutions, that's one of the most commonly requ requested features of any of these databases is, can you make it integrate with my old LDAP server? <laughs> All right, let's keep going. Okay, so now I want to project this even farther into the future. So if, I, if the things that I mentioned in the last slide are table stakes in terms of what it means to be Kubernetes native, where is all this going? We see this expanding in a few different directions. So I got the idea of drawing this out as uh, three axes, three dimensions. And then I kept thinking of dimensions and I decided not to add, try to extend this into the fourth dimension. Let's go with three. Okay, so one, and all, all these are, uh, reflect the idea of scaling in different directions. So microservices allow you to scale the different pieces of your architecture independently and it's a, a key part of um, being able to separate compute and storage and optimize the resources that you're using for each part of the database. Um, Multi-cluster and multi-cloud. So these are important because you wanna be able to scale your database to multiple clouds. Um, there's a lot that needs to happen here in terms of federation, but we're, we're pushing in this direction. Multi-tenant is a key thing that allows you to use resources the most efficiently and including maybe even scaling to zero if a particular tenant uh, isn't making use of some capability. And then finally, we need to be doing everything that we're doing in community, in conversation with each other, in DOK and other Kubernetes communities, and working in open source. Okay, next. Um, the one last thing that I wanna say is um, a big thank you to, uh, we had about 20 people uh, that we interviewed for the book. Um, and so there were some common themes that emerged from all these conversations that Patrick and I were able to have with Kubernetes and database and data infrastructure experts. We didn't just talk about databases. We talked to streaming folks. We talked to Holden about running Spark on Kubernetes. 
Um, and a bunch of other, other analytics stuff like Dask and Ray and Flink are in there as well. Um, common themes that came out of this that we, that we heard again and again, uh, high level categories of things, right? Uh, more improvements to stateful sets, they're great, but can they do more? Um, resources that would help us, like custom resources or, or common resources definitions that we could share about uh, across projects, right? Could there be common definitions of tenants or database backup and restore jobs? There's no reason that every project should have to have a different definition of each of these things. Uh, and then there's a, we heard a bunch of different things about um, allowing a little bit more fine-grained control of underlying hardware resources, like having more hard, hypervisor support, um, having a little bit more stringent quotas on different uh, compute and uh, storage utilization, and the ability to um, get a little bit more out of storage by asking it to go ahead and stripe a disk for you, things like that, okay? Um, so that's kind of a summary. There's a... Um, there's a lot that the data infrastructure community can do to make databases and data infrastructure better. Uh, and there's also things that we could do to make Kubernetes better to, and to kind of meet in the middle. Um, that's really it, I think. Go to the last slide. This should say thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I just really want to um, thank this community. This is, not, this is not a project that Patrick and I did. This is not a project that's possible without all of you. So thanks. Awesome.